Hi there, I'm Bob. Welcome to Tech Talk Weekly. This is our show from Creation Station where we put on two to three interesting tech stories. You know I never stay with only three, but we always go with that pre pretend that it's going to be two to three stories. We're going to cover it in 15 to 20 minutes and get you on your way a little bit smarter. Um, Creation Station at Broward.org comes directly to me. If you have any questions, if you want us to cover a particular story. And today, my featured co-host guest is Autumn Deck from Maine Library. How are you doing, Miss Autumn? I am doing well. Thank you for asking. How Thank are you? I'm doing great now that you're here. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Behind the scenes making the sausage. Autumn just got told she was going to be on this show about three minutes ago. Wait, well, well, she volunteered. Behind the scenes wait, wait, wait. making sausage? What is yes. that? I don't this understand. This is the making the sausage behind the scenes, doing all the stuff, getting the show ready, Sam getting Mike it all done. Donuts. No, we're not doing it. Anyway. No. So... <laughs> Um, Autumn is the head of youth services here at Maine Library, and I knew she was in her office, so I called her up real quick and said, hey, please. <laughs> so thank you for being here, Miss Autumn. Uh, our our uh, planned co-host today, uh, their library closed down just about an hour ago uh, due to some uh, mechanical issues. We don't know what yet. So it'll hopefully be open tomorrow, and I'll get touch base with him. But... Miss Autumn here has a lot of very cool stuff that she's been doing over the years here at Maine yeah. Library with um, youth services and doing some things. Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that afterwards because I got a feeling we're going to go go for some time on this one. Um, let's dive right into these stories that I just threw in her inbox and get her hot takes on these things. Um, so our first story today is about artificial or maybe non-artificial fibers to build things out of. So it's using genetic modification stuff to use natural fibers to build muscles to build, and you can weave these into fabric and you can do all these things. Um, it's just protein. So instead of having your t-shirt made out of cotton, you have a t-shirt made out of meat, baby. I don't know. Would you be wearing a shirt made out of meat? Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, first, first thing, I need to know what it smells like because I'm going to guess that these I just things feel just, yeah. like it's going to smell like some Jimmy Dean sausage. <laughs> oh, man. We need that Which product could placement be good on the show. At first, but yeah. Now the After, thing is you know. about this, it turns out protein regular protein fibers are actually stronger than Kevlar. Stronger than silk, cotton, Kevlar, everything when you weave them into a shirt, into kind of a fabric thing. So that was really that's one of the reasons I found this article so interesting, was just taking things. We did an article on using silk uh, about three months ago. Um, and some new things about how they were trying to do artificial silk. And I was like, oh, wait, hey. But yeah, I don't know. It's Does different. cotton have a smell? Uh, do cotton shirts know. smell different? I mean, no. Okay, well, I'm going to guess it's this process the same way, don't I, you think? I don't know. I mean, but then you have things like polyester that are just funky, no matter what. Um. This just has like a real Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. There you go. See, there you go. There's that meat. <laughs> There's that meat shirt coming right back up. Um, one Put of the, somebody like that out of business. So I guess it's a good thing. Yeah. Well, and one of the other <laughs> things that I found out there leading up to our second story here is this idea to be able to switch um, the healing on and off with some little artificial skin type things um, right here in this top picture you can see i'll highlight that up for you no nah, that that doesn't highlight that, very well at all work. does it that doesn't work well on that site um oops going back into our thing um and so what this does is it, it's got this really fine mesh that interlocks with your skin and interlocks with the um, tendons and everything in there to help grow and build things. Now, 
I found this article because it teased me on to the other idea from the artificial proteins because it, Autumn, you actually might be somebody who knows these things, the, the, like the anime and manga stuff with the giant robots that they have going around. You know those things from your time with the teens. Okay, so what, what, what's the question? So here's the idea. These proteins, these artificial proteins are how those robots work because they take this technology of that artificial proteins and this here with this healing ability here of this to create nerve, uh, to help the nerves function on this so that you can create artificial muscles. I know now, it is. See, Doesn't it okay. sound science fiction? So now we got some Cylons going on here. So we're hitting all of my key points of uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> meat shirts, fake muscles to put on androids, and no, nah, that. I mean, obviously, there are benefits that can happen for actual humans in this type of of thing. It it. Sounds to me like, uh, what was that? I was just looking up uh, epigenetics, being able to switch uh -huh. things on and yes. off in order to um, promote the healing or other things that they're uh, researching at the moment, like aging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, it sounds like they're on the right track, uh -huh. hopefully, and not putting you know, things onto fake muscles onto Boston Dynamics robots that will come and murder us in our sleep. So, Thank you very yeah. much. I'm sure we're going to cover that headline in a couple months when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is a story out in CNET uh, yesterday all about something not quite what you're talking about, but similar. Getting there. Yeah. Where they were able to take um, basically some Raspberry Pis and some, some very small little microelectronics computers to attach into the nerve endings coming off of a patient's shoulder and just those connections there leading to the actual robotic arm. And uh, we talked about this uh, in previous episodes also. You'll see in this picture it's got the, the uh, slightly more realistic skin on it. Um, that And this is not the one that has the sensors built in, but it's getting there. Um, but each of those boxes that you can see in that picture connects to a thumb or a finger. And by just connecting those into the nerves, the body rebuilds itself to reconnect to almost do the whole Star Wars, Luke Skywalker hand thing. Um, they actually have got a working model of this that amputees have been using in, in, their, in the Cleveland Clinic laboratory. That's, that's cool. I mean, you know, we've gone from Cylons to Borg uh -huh. now. So, yes. I mean, hey, we're just hitting them all. I know. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> it's crazy that all three of these stories came out within two days of each other. And I was so, just but like, I thought they already had things where they could feel the sensations and whatnot. You some you can uh, certain uh, applications can, but okay. this connects it directly into the patient's nervous system. And yeah, these are the first very the very first medical trials of this. It's Hope really don't interesting. Backfire. Yeah, <laughs> and as always, we'll put all these links in the show notes for everybody to see afterwards for us. Don't worry about that. Um, but the main story to me, and tell me. Or... I know. It's just, we were hoping everybody out there gets all these science fiction references she's throwing at you. Um, I better. <laughs> if not, you'll be able to come back and do a quick, do a quick search and come into the library and check out those movies and TV shows. <laughs> and what? Well, we have those all here. I bet you we do. I Probably. We, I would hope we do. Those are classics. We need to have them. But the big story that I found today um, and actually, I just found this one um, this morning from uh, a couple days ago was all about genetic testing. And we did a little bit of talk about this on our Creation Station Monthly. I'll come back and hit that in a minute. But making genetic testing available for everyone. 
for real things and not just, you know, 23andMe or Ancestry.com doing a quick, you know, who you might be related thing to. But this is the full genetic testing for cancer screenings and all that kind of stuff. So some of, I know because, I, I mean, I know you have as well. Yeah. I, I've done the 23andMe as as well. And there's some stuff you can look in the raw data to see um, a little more closely. Google the genes and be like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. and then check out your raw data. Um, obviously, there's the law, the genetic testing law that you can't be excluded from um, what is it? They can't, insurance companies can't look at the, the um, stuff to exclude you Correct. from this type of situation. I, I mean, I think it, it, it would be great. It's taking healthcare to a different place. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know for me personally, I had a genetic screening at my doctor's office years ago at the beginning of, or what I guess would be the peak, uh, the beginning of the peak of the opioid crisis to see what kinds of pain medication I can tolerate, you know, mm -hmm. what works best for me to try and keep me from getting yeah. addicted to opioids. I mean, I, I don't, I've never taken them, but if I needed that type of pain medication, they need, my doctor knows what to prescribe me based on my genetic profile. So fortunately it was, they didn't charge for it. Mm -hmm. It was just done. Well, they now, didn't did they the not charge company. you or did they bill the insurance company? They did not bill the, into the, the company, the, the, it was like one of those, you know, how they go into the doctor's office the, oh, the, okay, yeah. from the medical companies yeah, and are like, here, try our drugs or whatever. This was a similar situation, but it was a genetic testing company. Gotcha. And probably paid to try and mitigate mm -hmm. um, opioid use. And so they were just doing it, you know, and um, so that was, that was really, I was really fortunate to be in that office at that time when they did that. So something like what's being proposed here, it could be a big, a big deal for, for some people. However, uh huh. Yeah, yeah. That's it's also the thing. money out of the pockets of other people, and so that's just a real. Yeah. Who wins? Well, and part of it is who's doing the testing. Why? Like in your case, where the doctor's office is doing it, that's a really great example mm -hmm. of something that's going to further the science. It's going to help you personally use this customized science. But like they mentioned in the article, um, a life insurance company. Using it to determine risk of cancer. Uh, no, no. <laughs> well, but it's already because happening. That that's another no, I way. I know, and that's and unfortunately, based on the healthcare system we have in the United States, that's what's happening. Is instead of it being paid for as part of ACA or um, any of those sorts of things, it is the individual company. So a life insurance company gives you this test so that they can prove, okay, yeah, you're someone we want to insure because you don't, you're not going to die. And, oh, wait, you have this cancer gene. Oh, we're not going to insure you because you actually need the insurance to cover things. So we're not going to cover See, The lesson here is don't get life insurance that requires a test of any kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this might be. And but also just, yeah. Awesome. And then just the whole, you know, economic racial inequalities of the whole system of who Absolutely. has access to the tests to get the tests in the first place first. Mm -hmm. But then there's the issue on the other side of how do you, who do you allow to have access to your tests? Right. So yeah, that gets sketchy. And like I said, there are certain things that you, I guess, if it's if it's done by your doctor's office, obviously it's covered under HIPAA, right? So they saw. Can... I brought up Maybe. this article for you, of someone who it's it sounds like a great article. It sounds like a great thing. Here they did some genealogy testing, and it they found out who murdered this seventeen year old kid back in nineteen ninety nine. So let's see. 
who did who did the t what was it just like a just like a like a 23 and me type situation uh -huh. where you're like, oh god i want to know who yep. okay so that's a private company yeah and yeah they're like oh the the person who was tested for it so this is like not unlike the um oh my gosh the i'll be gone in the dark um the golden state killer situation uh -huh where they didn't identify the person who had been tested because right. they weren't the one who did it. It was like a cousin or something like that. So that person in and of themselves were not identified. However, you agree to have your genetic information shared for research, but your identity is not there. However, I'm assuming that if it's, it's just like with, uh, like when you go to see um, clergy, right? Or anybody really that has some, any kind of confidentiality. If there is a danger present mm -hmm. to yourself or other people, well, they can kind of skirt around issues that way. And, and that's like, hey. part of, right. And what kind of privacy do they have? Do, does your data have and who can have access to it? Can the police just walk in and get it? This ties into, I'll yeah. put a link um, up for it, our genealogy uh, talk that we did earlier this week as part of Creation Station Monthly, we touched on that DNA idea of who should have access to it, where's the privacy for it, and the idea that the you know some companies require a warrant, you know, you require you know a judge to sign off that yes, you can get this information about this person in our database, um, but not all companies do. Right. And so the but police and the other law enforcement, is. well, that's the issue. The, so the law enforcement is going through Ancestry.com or something like that and saying, here, we've got this person. And so we can now trace back and we've got DNA at a scene and we put that into the database themselves, the police do. And it turns back, oh, here's three close family matches for you. And so now you can start using the puzzle pieces to mm -hmm. figure it all out. Yeah, it's a really, sorry, really interesting. No. Yeah, like I said, yeah, I've, going read, back to, I've read yeah. the, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go, no, you go, yeah. So I, I, not that it's not technically related to this, but yeah, the, the, the Golden State Killer book, um, I'll Be Gone in the Dark by Michelle McNamara is, first of all, it's an excellent book because, you know, libraries promote books. Uh -huh. Hooray. But it details how they were just so they had no idea who this guy was no clue he was good he was very good at covering his tracks and also it was the 70s and 80s so they didn't have the technology available then that we do now and so when they went back with the technology we have now to certain um items from crime scenes it's a, it's a similar situation. They were able to track the guy down. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's just, first of all, it's a great read because her writing style was amazing. Um, it's kind of creepy. It's very creepy. So I don't recommend it for children. <laughs> it's an adult book. Um, but there's also a documentary that details, a docuseries that details the whole um, situation. And... It, it follows along the lines of this and it's just fantastic. And it's a real honest murder mystery. That's really cool. See, you already had your cool library fact for us. There we go. That is awesome. This is what real librarians do folks out there. She's good. Um, we read you, about murderers. <laughs> there you go. Hey, is it? it we won't talk about what <laughs> what we see on the TV when I when I wake up in the middle of the night. I go out and turn the TV off and see what's what Netflix has just been showing. Um, uh, just a real quick thing: it'll be in the notes. Uh, the Creation Station Monthly Genealogy. We touched on DNA. We touched on all sorts of stuff uh, celebrating the end of August, which was the end of Alex Haley's 100th anniversary um, for his birth. So um, go get a chance to watch that. It's been really well received. A lot of people have had a lot of fun with that out there. 
And we just flew right on past 20 minutes there, Miss Autumn. Thank you. I just you mentioned so one thing. One thing. So tell quick. me, tell oh me, tell gosh. me. So we currently in, in this whole thing about genetics in this last bit. So yeah. right now um, we have our director's book club. And the book that she is featuring is um, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Yes. So by Rebecca Sklute. So that is discussing the different research lines based on um, tumors taken out of Henrietta Lacks. So it's like a little bit of genetics, a little bit of science, medical, no, no murder. There's no murder in this one. That's but a, a good it's thing. still a great book. It's a very good book. And um, you can find that on the library's website. In our current yeah, magazine, and uh, the and in the, in the current magazine that there's the dates where uh, Allison Allison Grubb, the new library director, is going to be there doing book talks with everybody. Some of them are going to be in person, coming up here soon, and some are going to be online. So please pay attention to that as we move around and do our things. All right. Thank you again, Miss Autumn. That was amazing coming off of the bench <laughs> and hitting a home run for us. That was Pinch awesome. Hitter. That was great. Out of the park. Seriously the amazing. The right there. Yes. <laughs> you knew all of it that was going down. Let me throw yeah, up I our- just it. I'm really good at that. You, you did really, really well on that. <laughs> so let me throw up our final slide here for everybody. If there's a librarian you want to see featured or a library that you want to see featured one week, please email us creationstation at broward.org. And we will see, stay, see everybody next week. Stay safe. <laughs>